Good morning, everybody. Um, thanks very much for, for joining us today. Um, this is a, a Real Asset Media live event. Um, we're focusing this morning on Germany. Um, so this is a Germany investment briefing. Very good panel with us today. I'm just going to introduce those. Then we'll have a, a brief presentation from Matty Schenk from Savills, um, just to highlight some of the latest figures in the market. So let's let's just start um, with introductions. Um, Matty, maybe if, if you start, just, just a very brief introduction of, of yourself, um, and then we'll move around the panel so that then everybody knows who everybody is. Matty. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Matti Schenk and I am uh, part of the research team of several Germany since more than six years. So I'm mostly yeah, doing research on the German investment market and with special focus on residential and niche segments on the residential market like student housing and temporary living. Great, thanks very much. Um, uh, Tobias. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, Tobias Schultheis. Um, I am founder and owner of Blackbird Real Estate, which is a transaction advisory boutique with um, offices in Munich, Frankfurt, and uh, Cologne. Um, yeah, we are four people um, acting nationwide um, with no real focus on, on, on the type of use, um, but uh, with a yeah, special experience in offices. Great. Marcus. Yes, hi. Uh, I'm Markus Lemley. I run our um, the German business for Savills. Uh, my special focus is on the investment side, and I also coordinate our European investment activity. Super. Um, Rainer. Hi, good morning. I'm Rainer Nongesser from International Campus. We are a uh, developer operator in the student housing and micro living sector. Our main turf is Germany, Austria, and the Netherlands where we currently have some four and a half to five thousand beds in operation and we got a similar number under development in these countries great um christiana yeah thank you very much and good morning from my side to anyway um i'm a german qualified real estate lawyer focusing on, on real estate transactions <coughs> and since 2012 i also have a big focus on esg um, I work for PwC Legal and I'm based in, in London and I run the German real estate desk at PwC in London. Great, thanks very much. And uh, last but very much not least, Holger. Thank you and very warm welcome also from my side. My name is Holger Schmalfuss and I'm a senior relationship manager for Berlin Hip, a Berlin-based German fan brief bank. We do originate and manage a loan book uh, in Germany, of course, but also in Poland, the Benelux, and across France of around 20 billion. Great, thanks very much. Um, and um, one of the topics we'll be looking at particularly uh, is <coughs> that idea of whether or not Germany is, is still the hate, safe haven of Europe, um, or, or indeed whether or not it's actually more of a safe haven now. Um, so, so that's just one of the, the, the topics that, that we'll look at. Um, in, in terms of uh, in investment briefings, you may know us as the Real Asset Day, um, but also um, we produce Real Asset Insight, the magazine, every quarter. Um, we do Realcast, which is a weekly kind of analysis of the key trends, and we'll, we'll pick up on some of the trends that we've seen this session as well in that. And we've got a series of events that we're running looking at ESG, looking at various other topics. So please do sign up for those on the website. Let's let's start with you, Matty. Maybe just give us an update in terms of some of the things that you're seeing, particularly in, in the market at the moment, and, and I guess the what that means for the outlook for Germany. And yeah, it's a kind of uh, weird situation because uh, when we look on the, um, on the back on the first quarter, we saw record high transaction volumes. Um, we saw transactions amount to around 27 billion euro and therefore it was the uh, strongest opening quarters of all times and at the same time which you can see on this slide is um, that the rolling 12 months transaction volume ever um, it's part of the reality that this uh, extraordinary volume was also driven by some uh, major m a transactions like the takeover of other real estate on the residential market and the purchase of a majority share on TLG on the commercial market. Uh, but nevertheless, definitely a record high volume. But we have to say, and we are convinced, um, this is the past, this is history, and, and most likely uh, the more than 10 year during upcycle 
on the German uh, investor market it comes now to an end with the record first quarter. And now COVID-19 changes. Yeah, the world changes everything because uh, the full fundamentals, the economic background um, saw dramatically changes within weeks. And that's true for Germany as well. And um, yeah, as uh, COVID-19 and especially the measurements to prevent the uh, spread of the disease uh, lead to a unique situation where also the production and supply, but at the same time also the demand side is hit heavily hard. And um, therefore, uh, Germany will be clearly in a strong recession during this year. Predictions by International Monetary Fund for example, predict a decline of minus 7% for 2020. Um, the German IFO Institute, for example, predicts a range between minus 7 up to minus 20% for the worst case scenario. And um, which makes it clearly clear that uh, we, have, we are now in a completely different situation also for the real estate perspective, and um, which makes these um, pretty astonishing the effect uh, of the and also the momentum of COVID-19 uh, can be seen here in this chart showing um, the number of companies that are using um, short-time work. Short-time work is a tool in Germany to prevent job losses so in fact uh, companies can reduce their working hours and the state takes over some part of the salary. Um, and you see here it looks like a mistake but unfortunately it's not a uh, the number of companies using it or have to use it is skyrocketing since March. More than 720,000 companies are using this tool, showing that uh, there is a lack of, um, yeah, of production and services and so on and so forth. And um, please also notice the tiny little peak here in 2009, uh, which shows also the, the strong momentum and extraordinarity of the event we are facing now and since a couple of weeks. And yeah, for, of course, this is economic background, but we need to be aware that um, almost all of these companies you can see here on this chart uh, are in some kind of yeah, a, re a user of real estate in some kind, and like is it offices, whether it's retail or logistics, and therefore, of course, such a dramatic change of the economic con conditions will also lead to negative consequences on the occupier markets in the real estate business. And um, at least in the short term, we expect that uh, many companies uh, will uh, reduce their demand in real estate either in quantitative way or either in a qualitative aspect. And of course, there are rising risks in terms of occupancy or rental um, growth perspective, or at least there are risks for some, somewhere sometimes a rental decreases. Um, and I think that makes pretty clear that we are here also now in a different cycle, in a different world in the real estate market. And um, we also have to admit that uh, we are still in a very early stage of the pandemic. And therefore, um, there is a kind of lack of data showing really the, the intensity of the impact. And it's difficult to estimate now, but we can just look on what we see now and also of the plans of the market players. And um, when we come back um, to a situation where the occupier markets are faced with stronger risks, of course, this will lead to also a lot of uncertainty on the investment markets as well. And um, therefore, we expect a significantly decline in transaction activity over the last um, or over the next months. And yeah, especially um, the second quarter and, and Maybe afterwards we have to wait uh, during the uh, course of the pandemic. Um, what we see now is that um, transactions which are already in an advanced stage uh, are still be completed and continued. And we also hear that many investors, especially those ones which are very equity rich, equity driven, are still willing to purchase. But at the same time, we we can say, see that many investors also um, are facing with some practical burdens. For example, foreign investors have currently not a good access to the market due to travel restrictions, contact ban, and so on. And therefore, uh, the dominating uh, behavior at the moment is really um, some kind of orientation. Many investors have paused the purchase plans, and yeah, this will lead to shrinking number of transactions. 
But nevertheless, uh, we can still see some part of these effects, which you can see here on this slide. Um, it's showing the number of transactions in the first quarter of this year and the previous two years. And what you can see is that uh, till yeah, roughly end of February, the number of transactions was all in all in line with the previous two years. But then when it becomes uh, pretty clear that also Europe and first, unfortunately, Italy are hitting hard by the pandemic as well. And later when it becomes also clear that also Germany have to um, introduce uh, very strict measures to prevent the spread of the disease, then you see that the number of um, transactions is, is slowing down in terms of the momentum and you can see that this line is moving away from the previous two-year charts. And I'm convinced if we look on such a chart in one month, two months or three months, then we will definitely see even stronger negative impact on the investment activity due to this uncertainty, especially in terms what will be uh, um, the effects on the occupier markets. And of course, um, when we see um, shrinking number of transactions, this will lead most likely also to shrinking numbers of transaction volumes. And um, it's still in the early stage, so difficult to estimate how, uh, yeah, let's say how, how strict the uh, effect will be. But uh, what we did, we did a small survey at Savills amongst uh, our heads of research worldwide. And those 24 researchers are, uh, yeah, give predictions where they expect the most negative or at least the most resilient reaction in terms of types of users related to the um, impact on the transaction volume in 2020. And what we see, which is maybe not surprising, is that uh, the hotel sector is, will be most likely facing the, the way the strongest negative impacts, but also the retail sector, country, the food anchored retail might be still in a good behavior in Germany, but all everything else, of course, there are rising risks due to the shutdown. And also for, for offices, many researchers expect at least a shrinking transaction volumes. But there's also some good, um, ex or some good examples or positive uh, examples. You can say uh, that um, we also expect that some uh, type of real estate might be quite resilient during this crisis namely healthcare, logistics, industrial, and also residential sector is um, mostly seen as a quite resilient uh, part of real estate during this uh, um, yeah, economically shock. And, um, but overall, when you look at this chart, you see the purple colors are dominating, meaning shrinking volumes. And when we take into consideration that the whole economically uh, environment have changed, rising risks for the occupier markets, uh, slowing down of transaction activity, uh, travel restrictions, slowing numbers or slowing volumes. Of course, this can also be translated in risks or high possibility that also the yields will be rising in the next time. And indeed, we uh, expect in the short term that yields will rise across almost all asset classes and also all risk classes. Um, as I said, it's partly because some investors have not a good access to the market at the moment, but it's also, and that's the main driver from our perspective, that the majority of investors will for sure revise uh, their rental growth perspectives due to the changed um, environment. And um, yeah, this must have effects on the yields. Um, when we look back on last crisis, it was also always a time that the non-core segment was uh, marked by even stronger reactions than for the core properties. And we believe that this might be the case this time as well, meaning that we see even stronger rising yields for non-core properties, but in the core properties, which are yeah, providing some kind of security, what everybody is looking for now, there might be a lower effect due to this um, yeah, crisis. So just to summarize it also, we, we look back on an extraordinary uh, first quarter, but it was like completely, yeah, let's say old world, old situation. And in the new world, we are definitely facing also in Germany rising risk in terms of the occupier markets. And therefore we expect uh, in the near future a slowing down of transaction activity, volumes and rising yields uh, in the short term. I wanted to, to just pick up <coughs> with you, um, Reiner. 
Um, what's your sense of the what's your sense of the impact, I suppose, on on the on the virus, particularly on uh, I mean, I guess on, on Germany in general, but also specifically on on your part of the business. Well, on on, on Germany, um, it's it's hard to say. Uh, we we have now for four or five consecutive weeks pulled the plug on nearly everything of social life. The economic has, has uh, besides retail, uh, groceries come to an end as in every European country. We have implied some, some measures earlier this week to uh, start the way back to normality, however normality will look like uh, after we have gone through this phase. But, uh, uh, in, in the light of this, hard to predict what the next weeks will really look like. On our business, uh, I think it's you clearly need to distinguish between the uh, uh, development part and the operational part. On the operational <coughs> part, we're doing pretty good. Compared to hosp hospitality, we're doing extremely good as we are uh, some 95 97% occupied uh, as regards rental contracts in place. We are currently still in a situation that we are in uh, a vacation mode as we are in between two semesters. Summer semesters have been delayed as regards their start. A lot of universities have announced that they will not hold any presence lectures in summer semester. So the current presence on our schemes vary between 50 and 60%. Uh, keeping fingers crossed, we haven't had any positive corona case on our houses. We have followed the measures which have been implied on, on all hospitality-like uh, schemes, meaning we have locked the communal areas, the communal kitchens, which has been well accepted by the tenants because it's in, in the interest of their own safety. So on the operational part, <coughs> we're doing, I think, pretty well. We have regular exchange with our uh, uh, market participants to, to learn from each other and to get uh, feedback on which measures they apply. And also in the light of this, I think we're doing pretty good. And uh, on the development investment side, things look uh, a little bit different for sure. We have slowed down transaction activities. We are following those transactions that we have initiated uh, late last year or earlier this year to keep the momentum on our pipeline. Our developments, again, fingers crossed, all our construction sites are operational. So far, we have not seen any shortages as regards supply or labor. Uh, due to the corona impact and uh, we, we see some some minor dips short-term dips in uh, the delivery schedules but I think all in all the Hamburg scheme and the one in Prague who are supposed to come to market in the course of this year will be available and ready uh, more or less in time as planned. Great, thanks. Um, and and Marcus, just just coming to you, um, I suppose let's let's drill down a little bit at, at Germany, but also maybe in the context of Europe. Um, how are you seeing the how are you seeing the market currently? Um, and I suppose what are some of your expectations? Just maybe just highlight some of the some of the research you've been doing in that area. Um, yeah, well. Um I think after we had uh, these um, first week of um, everybody going uh, going mobile and moving into uh, a smart office move, um, things have um, come back into um, uh, reasonable shape quite quickly. So um, the players have adapted, and uh, what we are seeing is is really a, a, a two stories developing. So the market right now is um, is, is polarizing, uh, focusing on the one side and um, stronger on income, and um, on the one hand, and having a growth on um, a growth story on on the other hand. 
Um, so that, those two stories are polarizing the market and that is uh, reflected in, um, in, in, in pricing where the price gap between the two different kind of approaches is, is widening. And so, so it's really a, a market of, uh, of two stories as an, as an initial reaction from, uh, from investors. Altogether, of course, activity has slowed. Um, the general situation is that uh, uh, the, the big strategic transactions are still progressing. Everything in an advanced stage is, is going ahead um, as planned um, and has been going ahead as planned with only um, little effect on, on pricing for the, um, for the income deals, for the core strategies and um, further a stronger impact on pricing for a secondary product where there's a strong focus on, uh, on growth and rental growth because that perspective has changed. So yeah, a new, a completely new um, market environment, uh, which we are, uh, which we are going into. Okay, good. Um, uh, and Tobias, just in terms of um, what you're seeing in the market, because um, often also you're looking at uh, some of the, the more regional cities in, in Germany and different types of assets. Um, what are you seeing, I suppose, in terms of um, activity in the market, but also investor appetite? Uh, well, I, I have seen that, say, the whole range from investors saying they, they do nothing um, these days and they just wait until we come all back to normality, whatever this is. Um, the majority is more in a um, phase of, of just checking and looking, um, but not really doing business. But we also see investors that um, yeah, do business as usual. They, they have the pockets full of money they want to buy. And um, as Marcus just said, um, there are some who focus on income and I don't see um, prices going down for high quality um, bond-like um, properties. But uh, the more question marks properties have, um, the prices um, go down. Uh, in terms of um, smaller cities, um, there was an interesting article from, from Diog Real Estate uh, in the news yesterday uh, stating that there are um, extremely stable office re rental markets for, for office space, which is also my experience with my, my own uh, portfolio, where no tenant um, asks for a rent deferment or rent de um, decrease. So, knock on wood, um, we are still <clears throat> yeah, experiencing more of a, a stable situation, but um, this is only my personal experience. Okay, good. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up a little bit on, uh, on capital markets in a minute and, and capital flows and how we see that heading. Um, and j just a reminder that if you've got questions that you want to ask, there should be a Q&A button there. Um, so feel free to write in any questions and, and I'll make sure I, I deal with those. Um, Holger, just in terms of the, um, I, I suppose, the financing side, I mean, the, the previous crisis that we saw in 2000 you know, 2008, the global financial crisis was very much a financial crisis. Um, whereas here, if we even look at those initial slides that we just saw, um, there's an issue for companies and solvency and those kinds of things. Um, I suppose, what's the position at the moment in terms of financing more broadly in your view, but also the influence there, not specifically on real estate finance? Just, I absolutely agree with your view compared to uh, the last crisis, um, the sort of predominantly financial crisis we are seeing now, something which actually involves every sector of the society and of the economy. So that makes a big difference. Nevertheless, um, banks are generally at the moment open for business, but do certainly act much more cautiously and are very busy with screening their loan books and uh, checking on the performance of their um, exposures. Banks who rely on funding um, via capital markets, like we are, um, face also a challenging funding environment, as in any crisis, liquidity um, is becoming more expensive, and um, our clients certainly will note that because um, the rates we are currently quoting have increased simply um, of an increase in funding costs. And we're talking about here about probably 50 dips plus and minus. So um, compared to interest levels we have seen, that is quite significant. 
syndication um, is currently very difficult, particularly for those positions where prices have been agreed before the COVID-19 uh, crisis started. So um, some banks may find it difficult to sell down positions they're currently holding. And um, certainly the old fashioned market flex clause um, has a revival and um, will be definitely in contracts going forward. Okay, good. Um, and uh, Marcus, I wanted to just pick up a, a little bit in terms of, uh, of, of capital flows. Um, how are people seeing, um, I suppose, how are people seeing investment in Europe more generally, um, but also also specifically um, for Germany? Um, and I'm, I'm just going to do a quick poll whilst you're giving us an answer to that, uh, which is, will Germany be seen as the safe haven for investors, still be seen as the safe haven for investors? And the answers available are, which should be on your screens, hopefully, yes, as before, no, uh, or yes, it'll be seen as even more of a safe haven. Um, so I'll, I'll be interested to see uh, see what the, the views of that are. But um, but what's your sense of that, Marcus, in terms of the, the perception of investors? Looking at Europe, there's probably three groups of countries and three groups of markets uh, forming um, with investors taking uh, different views um, on these uh, markets. Probably, um, of course, the core markets, um, and, and uh, UK, of course, course as, as the most important market but uh, on continent focusing on continental Europe there's um, the core markets France and Germany really um, investors are uh, then looking at uh, probably the growth markets um, southern Europe Spain and Italy currently most affected uh, from from the virus situation and also eastern Germany and the third group of probably the more stable markets around uh, um, Benelux, Netherlands, and, and probably all, uh, Sweden also. And investors are taking uh, different um, different approaches on those markets. Uh, on the one hand, while the general themes uh, of um, growth and income is is, is, the, is the is the same overriding. So we're seeing in, in, the, in the growth markets, we're seeing investors uh, very careful. Um, uh, transaction activity has slowed very significantly. It's becoming harder for investors to price uh, real estate, and therefore um, they, uh, they're very cautious on, uh, on, on transacting in these markets. Uh, on the, the more stable markets, uh, Benelux, uh, Netherlands, we're still seeing activity. They're less volatile historically, so less movement on uh, on rents. Good covenants in many of those markets. In Sweden, we're still seeing, um, and, and, and Denmark, quite a bit of activity. Good domestic um, uh, investors, so no, no strain also on, uh, on, on the financing. And um, quite uh, quite quite reasonable activity with um, probably uh, um, very very small uh, price adjustments uh, on on some of the uh, on some of the deals. And in the core market, uh, that's pretty much where uh, the the action still is, where there is a, a lot of domestic money, and uh, these uh, equity rich players are really dominating the the activity uh, around. Um, investments with long leases and in, in, in core locations. So uh, the German funds, um, the big players, uh, Decker Union, uh, the Deutsche Bank, Commerce, um, but also the large insurance um, uh, companies, maybe to a lesser degree, but uh, uh, the pension funds, they're still active. The French funds in, in France are active. Uh, we're selling um, uh, uh, Prop core property in Paris right now, and we've even seen a uh, pricing increase in the in the second round, um, spiked by um, competition among French uh, French institutions. So uh, pretty much three um, three groups of, uh, of of countries with um, a, a different profile and different ways of investors acting in that uh, context. Okay, interesting. So 53% uh, think Germany will be seen as the safe haven for investors the same as before. Only 10% think no, that it won't be seen as a safe haven. 
and 38%, <laughs> I think it'll actually be seen as even more of a safe haven. That's interesting. Obviously, it's, a, it's only a, a sample um, here from the real estate side rather than the general populace, but that's, uh, but that, that's very interesting, I think. Maybe, maybe adding, just adding on that safe haven uh, piece, um, I, I personally also think um, Germany will enjoy that safe haven status again. Um, on the one hand, of course, many countries are copying what uh, worked well in, in Germany and last crisis 10 years ago, so keeping the uh, fabric of the economy pretty much in place, keeping people employed uh, by, um, by, by uh, subsidizing um, heavily, and, and that worked really well for Germany last time round. Um, this time round, we're seeing that all over continental Europe happening, so all governments trying to copy uh, this uh, system. But uh, non nonetheless, I think uh, Germany is, is just a little more experienced, uh, probably, with managing this situation. I think there's basically three three strong reasons why uh, Germany will um, will be uh, ever more um, the safe haven for investors in uh, in Europe. I think um, on, on the one hand, obviously the healthcare system is uh, it seems pretty solid with good capacities and the response um, policy makers and uh, the, uh, the, the population is giving to this crisis is rather measured and, uh, and therefore the uh, impact, uh, while it of course is there, but seems a rather measured impact. So strong healthcare system. Secondly, I think unemployment will be comparatively lower than in other countries. And we're looking at the, the, the states with uh, 22 million of unemployed over the last uh, uh, three to four weeks alone. Uh, that uh, is, is nowhere um, near anything what's happening in, uh, in Germany. And then, of course, uh, being a, a, company, uh, a country with significant fiscal uh, possibilities, I think uh, that capital will, uh, will be put to work uh, wisely to, um, to keep the economy going. So I think a strong healthcare system and reasonable growth of, of unemployment and uh, a wide fiscal uh, possibilities will uh, will make Germany a safe uh, a haven uh, again and we're seeing that uh, reflected on the capital markets and in the low uh, interest rate of the German Bund and real estate uh, will follow in that uh, in that path okay Matty is that you who've returned to us yeah hello yeah sorry my computer was shut down I'm I'm back only on phone on phone <laughs> thanks very much Matty um, Christiana I just wanted to come come to you. I'm, I'm going to come to some of the questions which are around um, particularly some of the themes from, from uh, the crisis. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to pick up, Christiana, because I know ESG has been a, a kind of topic for you. Um, my sense is that because there's an absence of flights, there's an absence of travel more generally, um, an increased focus on wellness and those kinds of things, that maybe one of the things coming out of the the crisis is is more of a focus on on ESG in comparison to to what happened certainly after the global financial crisis what, what's your sense of that yeah yeah that's also what i or we see currently but um there's a the discussion about yeah the the consequences of the current pandemic on ESG um qualities is, is like a very heated discussion. So for example, the UN published an article yesterday focusing on, um, on governments in you know, very distressed countries who are considering to reduce the environmental standards to focus more on the economy. So that, that threat is definitely there at the moment. But overall, what we see is that so even before the, uh, the current pandemic, there was a huge um, demand for um, ESG um, compliant or um, yeah, investments with a high ESG standard. So, and what we see here right now is that that demand is currently increasing. 
So companies are very well watched right now, how they treat their, their employees, their clients, their stakeholders, and how responsible they act in the, in the current crisis. So this is really a, a testing phase for them. So look at Germany, look at Adidas. At, they announced that they would redu- wouldn't pay any rental payments anymore. So I think um, this really highlights um, that you need to be kind of careful with the decisions that you make. And what we, we also see is when it comes to ESG, one of the main aspects in implementing ESG strategy is adopting a life cycle approach and to, to have more resilient investments in the end. So we, ex- we didn't expect a pandemic caused by a virus. We expected extreme weather events or um, our uh, social unrests when we, we first talked about ESG. Um, but now we, we kind of see that this resilience that should be a result of an ESG strategy is also working for um, yeah, in the current crisis. So yesterday or a couple of days ago, HSBC also review, published an article how ESG um, compliant um, firms um, we've seen in the capital market. And what you see there is that they are much better positioned than other firms. And also when it comes to, um, yeah, we heard it before from, from um, Holger. So um, the banks are all in a very difficult position. Um, and it's, it will be more, it is already more competitive and I expect it to be even more competitive over the next months um, to get access to financing. And um, what we see also from our clients is that more and more and think it's, they will be in a better position to access financing if they have ESG quality yeah, <laughs> compliant products. That piece, uh, Christian, I would uh, like to pick up with, with Olga um, a, a theme um, that we're hearing from a number of um, investors and that is around the limited availability of debt. It's not only a question of uh, increasing margins, but uh, also simply the, the limited availability of, of debt. Is that uh, only due to more limited and closed syndication market or are um, banks uh, simply reluctant to um, to give out volumes in order to uh, protect their balance uh, sheets, and uh, or is it sim- simply an excuse of some of the investors uh, to uh, retrade on the pricing um, uh, uh, using bank finance as an excuse? So is it reality or is it an excuse? And how, how do you expect that over the next six uh, months to uh, un- unfold from from your perspective? I guess this question goes to me, Richard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's looking like it, Holger. <laughs> uh, certainly the later, uh, it's always an excuse. But um, <laughs> no, the situation has certainly changed. Um, we do see requests coming in and we look at them. So um, most of the banks haven't stopped lending. Um, but as I said before, they are certainly more cautious. Um, I would not necessarily uh, make a distinction by existing clients versus new clients because there are still a lot of interesting clients I would love to do business with uh, or um, active property investors. The distinction, I think, goes more along the asset classes. There is a definite yes on residential finance and on long leased office because they appear, at least at the moment, to be least affected by the corona crisis. There is a maybe for developments, but that is going to move to more conservative terms, to guarantees, maybe in recourse, and to much higher pre-letting levels. And there is, I think, a very clear no to whatever is operational and currently closed, like hotels, we touched on that, and also on any business strategy who relies on future increases of rents. That is something we have seen in Berlin quite a lot, um, that investors would buy relatively expensive assets at very low yields with the clear expectation that um, to relet at higher rents. And um, even if that may be answers back at some point, I think this business case wouldn't be underwritten by a bank. On the other hand, uh, Marcos, and and that's where the investors probably are right, um, lending has become more expensive and my clear expectation would be that the margins are going to move at some point as well, not just the liquidity costs. 
And that means that the investment calculation obviously needs to be adopted. What may help here is that the regulator has already acted and is reviewing actually to delay the introduction of BAL4, which would have had a quite severe impact on the way we are pricing our loans. So if that doesn't kick in, it's certainly helping the current lending operation. Yeah, so I think, and you see in, in your space, uh, new players moving in to the market, taking advantage of, of that situation. So uh, um, a stronger presence uh, from debt funds, uh, for example, to uh, replace maybe some of the banks. That's, this is interesting. And I think it's an interesting question because I think also it's pretty early to conclude on that. Um, from a client perspective, in meaning sponsors and borrowers, I would hope that um, this is probably also a chance for us as a very conservative senior lender to get back into business with people we haven't done business for a while because they would have looked for more risky lending structures, probably with uh, funds, probably with insurers, probably with somebody else. And um, as I now may consider uh, lower year leverage and lower um, risk profile on their financing, there may be actually a new target or a new target again for us. Um, in terms of the funds, my perception is they, they keep lending. The increase of the coupon, the all-in rate, may help the insurance companies also to lend because they price differently than we do. So um, I believe at the end of the day, that is a spot uh, to be watched and it's a little bit early to say what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. We're clearly seeing we're clear, clearly seeing the market um, in these uh, weeks being dominated by the uh, equity-rich uh, players to um, to basically avoid the, the, the financing situation. Um, and I think that's also a question of uh, of resources, physical resources within uh, some of the banks and even the smaller Sparkassen, uh, Volksbanken uh, that are lending uh, to local investors, local uh, developers. They um, they are focused very much on their corporate business and, and don't seem to have the resources to work through the whole um, their, their whole book right now. So it's uh, it's really a time for for equity rich uh, rich investors. And there's, uh, there's a lot of domestic players um, in that category. And also, interestingly, also a number of, um, of fund managers uh, currently being active who are drawing down on committed equity. Um, I think that's another interesting observation that it's not only the equity players directly uh, playing, but also a number of fund managers with committed capital from those equity rich uh, investors. Uh, so um, I think um, very important for vendors to look at the bidders and see exactly how they are financed um, uh, when when making that uh, selection with whom to to go ahead. That's In great. terms of financing, I also would uh, probably widen the focus from new investments to the existing portfolios. Yes, because um, I mean. Even before Corona, we all agreed that the market cycle is somewhere close or at the top. And uh, no one is probably surprised that yields at some point have moved or starting to move out again. What is new now is the pressure on rental income, not just the absence of rent increase, but also maybe potential loss um, of in place rents. And that, of course, will feed through to the performance in respect of covenants. And um, in respect of the valuation of the security provided. So, um, as well, here, I think it's too early to call um, what is going to happen. But um, given that the property market and the property financing market sort of luck behind anyway, the general um, development of the economy, um, there may be also some trouble ahead for banks, which then have to rely on, on covenants and on keeping cash and yields, um, assuming that they insisted on covenants in the first place. 
Good. I mean, we've got around 15 minutes um, left, so I want to pick up some of the audience, the questions that have been coming in from the audience. There's a, there's a lot on, um, on office. Uh, there's a lot on um, a new, new types of new types of office. Um, and I'm going to come to that on the office sector specifically. But I wanted to broaden that to a certain extent. And, and Rainer, just, just come to you for a second, because a lot of those questions coming in uh, from Chris Lavery um, and, and also from Tristan there are, are about, you know, people, people are having to get used to different ways of working. Um, but also, depending on how long the restrictions last, may have to get used to a different way of using space. Um, Obviously, you've got very specific space there. Um, how, how does that impact on you potentially in an operational way? And are you having to rethink some of the some of the models? Well, I think we need to clearly distinguish between the student accommodation sector and the non-student side of the business. On the student side, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that what we have seen in the past will also be a role model for what is coming in the next years. And what is it? All crises we've seen in the last 20 years have led to an increase of student figures, not only in Germany, but globally, because higher accommodation always has been seen, higher education, sorry, has always been seen as an investment in the future of individuals. And uh, if you draw the parallel to the uh, financial crisis we had in 2009, 2010, we have seen a strong inflow from uh, uh, EU people, young people from the Mediterranean uh, area into Germany, A, to uh, take courses on university, but B, also linked you to the economic situation of these countries with the idea and the hope to find a job in Germany. And depending on what, in, in which structural way the EU countries will finally come out of this crisis, I could imagine that we end up in a pretty similar situation, which are all arguments for, yes, the, the, the trend to higher uh, education will remain and will increase. And as a, uh, a side effect out of this, we will see an increasing shortage in housing for people in education. On the micro living side, I think things are more related to the economic situation. And here you need to distinguish between short stay and long stay. Short stay, which is more a hospitality type of product, for sure sees shortfalls from companies limiting travel and uh, currently in the lockdown, all of the hotels and all of the service department uh, operators uh, are uh, facing this situation. And uh, on the those uh, operators, like we do, who are looking more on long-term stays, meaning commuters, people on projects, for sure there is also a dip situation in a lockdown situation. But I think here... Uh, whilst we come back to normality, whilst we see first signs of recovery and um, economy restarts, we will also see the renaissance or the restart of uh, commuting trends and um, of uh, temporary absence trends. And uh, I think micro-living products uh, will definitely benefit from these trends as well. Okay, good. Um, uh, maybe Tobias, just just starting with you, and then everybody else, feel free to come in on this, um, because there were a lot of a lot of questions, particularly about um, home office here, um, people getting used to working from home, um, and and just how much that will change, if it will. Um, a the requirement for offices, um, but also um, what those offices will look like, and whether or not there'll have to be adjustments. And therefore, who will pay for those, I suppose. Um, what's, what's your sense? Do you think that will be a, a long lasting thing? Or do you think people will be actually desperate to get back to the office to be it? <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm not sure if they're desperate, but I, I think people want to meet people want to uh, not only um, work together by um, video, they, they want to meet in person. So my personal guess is that um, there will maybe not be um, the office market will not be as it was before um, this, this, this crisis. 
um, I can imagine that um, some companies will change their, their programs and, and um, increase uh, homeworking. But um, I, I don't see um, a vast or uh, a major reduction of um, office space being looked for. I think we're cur currently seeing, just adding to that, um, there. Just adding to that, I think we're seeing, uh, we're, we're living the biggest uh, home office and mobile office experiment um, we, we, can, we have ever lived through. And uh, there, there's going to be a lot of things we learn from uh, this in, in terms of efficiency and how, how to use home office. And I think what will come out of and what we're seeing already from tenants is that there's a greater need for flexibility. Um, greater need for flexibility in all uh, sense, flexibility in the office space that can accommodate more social distancing. So there's um, uh, there's there's that need, and uh, then there is the need um, of uh, less uh, less fixed um, office uh, um, spaces and more mobility within the office uh, area. So it's it's a theme around uh, flexibility and uh, and tenants. How are they reacting um, already in their existing uh, searches with us? They are either reducing space uh, slightly or reconfiguring. Uh, space uh, with uh, with more areas for flexible um, office concepts um, to be incorporated into their their areas. Okay, good. Um, there's limited time left, so just just in terms of the um, the questions. Also, what I forgot to mention is that actually, if you like a particular question, um, please do like it, and then it will go to the top of the list, um, and and it will definitely get asked then. Um, Christiana, just just quickly from you, I mean, I know that there's some slides that we can share after this uh, with with guests, so that then everybody can see these. Um, but just in terms of the the sort of legal aspect, we've got a lot of discussion here, a lot of questions around rent. Um, what you know? Are we seeing rent defaults? What's the position? Um, just, just from a kind of legal perspective, um, how are you seeing that? Because I guess that's that's a big part of the the kind of thoughts at the moment, both for investors but also occupiers. Yeah, yeah, totally. We're seeing that. So we've been actually quite busy over the last couple of weeks with the new legislation in Germany, basically the COVID-19 um, Mitigation Act. Um, at PwC Legal, we also looked at, an, at from an international perspective, we um, prepared a comparative guide for 11 European jurisdictions. And when you look at that, you see that the German legislative package is quite comprehensive. And what we understand from our institutional investors that it's it's being regarded as being quite balanced so yeah however so when it comes to um, to rent um, rental payments potential rent reductions the situation is 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 not really unclear so we deal with a bit of legal uncertainty here but which in the end personally I think is, is a good thing so according to this mitigation act um, we only have a suspension of termination rights of landlords if the tenant is in default of rental payments in the period from eight April to, to end of June because or as a result of the corona pandemic. So, but this only means that the landlords cannot terminate if the tenant um, is, is in default. So this, this law doesn't say anything about um, um, potential rent reductions. And we also don't have the, the concept of force majeure in German law, but we have some other principles according to which in, in the single cases, the, the rent and might be reduced. Um, for example, if you have um, 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 ordinances, regulations to close um, retail shops completely, to, to don't allow the public to, to access the, the premises anymore, there are really good arguments that the tenants are not obliged to pay 100% of the, of the rent anymore. But it, it's unclear. There, um, if the rent is being reduced to 75 or 50 percent or 25 percent, so this really depends on on the single case. But on, then we have also different regulations in different states, so you need to look carefully. So and, and what I said, okay, so many of particularly of the retailers were looking forward to a legislation bringing some clarity here and saying, okay, the rent tenants are not allowed to pay any rent anymore at only 50 percent if you have a, a closer regulation. 
question. But in the end, from a, from a legal point of view, I, I really appreciate that the, um, that the principle of the, the separation of power in Germany has been complied with by the German government. So these are questions which depend on the single case, on the agreements and the lease agreements, and will be decided by the courts later. But as a consequence, which is also a positive thing, is that um, what we see here is that more and more tenants and landlords, they need to work together and they started to collaborate and find some agreements, for example, on, on rent deferrals or even on reductions for a certain period of time. And as, as Marcus or said before, I think also here it's about flexibility. So um, ensuring that um, both yeah, the situation is changing daily by new regulations by the federal states or even the cities. So it's it's quite important um, that you are able to to amend the agreements made, um, yeah, if need be, quite quickly. Okay, good. Um, I, I'm I, I'm going to try and finish as close as I can on time, but there's some definitely some questions that I want to want to pick up and answer uh, for the attendees here. Um, so let's let's try and quickly run through some of these um just in terms of of rentals i mean we heard that um certainly from from holger's point of view that people shouldn't be expecting um rent increases or at least basing a strategy around that um what's the sense of anybody here to be a, a what have you seen in terms of i suppose your clients or your investors in terms of of rents um, is there a difference between, uh, I suppose, A locations and, and B locations in terms of, uh, of rental returns? What, what's, what's your sense of, of rent at the moment? My experience with, with like, the investors we talk to is um, they very much look on, um, on, on stable rental income. They don't look at um, rental increases, as, as Holger mentioned earlier. Um, <clears throat> and there's no distinction between A and B cities. Um, people we are mandates we have um, is um, f uh, we have mandates with um, yeah, fully let properties uh, where we have the discussion is this rent over or under market rent this is a tough discussion these days um, but uh, at the bottom line my, my experience is that investors um, don't see rental increases over the um, next months and they, they clearly focus on on yeah, signed lease contracts and they accept rents if they were market before the crisis. Okay, good. Um, and just to, just in terms of looking, I suppose, at, at different sectors, um, we've got also a lot of questions coming in about um, which sectors do we think are more resilient um, from from the crisis. Um, what are the what are the senses of that in terms of the more resilient ones? We've had questions about hotels and leisure, uh, which generally appear to be uh, being perceived as, along with retail, as, as those that will struggle a little bit in the in the crisis. Um, what's anybody's on uh, anybody's take on? Uh, I guess the 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 more resilient sectors. We've seen the crisis um, overall um, as a catalyst to many many of the development. Uh, many of the developments around digitalization that are uh, going on and logistics here clearly is a sector that is uh, is proving resilient and uh, is enjoying uh, good investor demand and even uh, good good tenant demand so i I'd, I'd really uh, put a focus on on res uh, on on logistics and um, also on uh, on residential, uh, not only in in Germany, but we're seeing that in other countries as well. We've just traded on a on a significant uh, uh, um, residential portfolio in the Netherlands with uh, absolutely no no price discount, a strong demand, competitive bidding. So um, residential and logistics are currently clearly uh, proving to be uh, resilient. Okay, good. Um, do, is there a sense as well in terms of what you mentioned logistics there? Uh, there's a question that, that's come in also on that. Um, near shoring, um, will Germany dramatically change its model or behavior in terms of uh, near shoring? And if so, what will be the implications for pricing? I don't know if you want to pick that up. I think it's really early um, to comment on that. We've seen uh, that trend uh, in the last crisis ha happening. Um, uh, supply chains being brought in and uh, and, and closer um, we're likely to see something similar um, happen um, this time around but it's probably too early to tell them that does not yet have a real 
real impact on, uh, on manufacturing and, and industrial space. Okay, good. Reiner, in, in terms of your sense, uh, do you see residential as, as more resilient? I mean, uh, uh, in, in, and particularly in terms of the student housing part of the, the business, there was also a question, specific question about, um, are you able to already see whether there'll be a change in demand from international students, such as from China and, and things like that? Um, it's it's uh, pretty early to see any trends as of now because a lot of the com countries are locked down and we have travel bans. But as said earlier, I'm, I'm quite convinced that we will see uh, in autumn uh, figures picking up. And uh, when the university system comes back to normality and uh, um, I would be really surprised, as mentioned earlier, if uh, we would not see a trend of increasing uh, student applications in Germany, especially from other European countries and also from other affected companies, as we expect the German economy to bounce back in a potentially better shape than other European economies. Okay, a um, quick one here from Richard Kolb. Thank you for that. Uh, the case for safe haven Germany is quite convincing. Uh, however, do the panel see any scenarios where Germany could lose this status, e.g. due to heavy reliance on exports and manufacturing? Yeah, again, we have to say we are in a very early stage and we have to wait uh, how will be the uh, pandemic uh, trends in Germany as well. Uh, I mean, we saw some softening since yesterday, but um, we have to wait and what will be the case in some weeks or months ago. So I think um, uh, in generally, um, of course, the German economy is quite export orientated. So we also have to are a little bit dependent on this situation in other countries. But uh, as I think already mentioned, the uh, measurements by the German government in terms of stability and so on, I think, are, are fostering the view and also, uh, as Germany as a safe haven and also stabilizing um, the German economy. Um, so, um, yeah, I've, but in, in all, uh, we still have <laughs> to wait uh, what's going on in the next month. But generally, up to now, I... I don't see really signs that uh, this picture might change dramatically um, in the next future. Okay, good. And Matty, just, just, just in terms of um, retail assets, I mean, the, the perception in general has been that, um, that retail leisure hotels uh, will suffer at least, uh, let's say, for, for hotels. I think it was one of your research papers, actually, not you personally, but from Savills, maybe that was looking at the hotel sector. Um, but a lot of the general view seems to be that coming back in sort of, uh, you know, Q3, Q4, 2021 for leisure. Um, but but what's, what's your sense of that, both for, for retail and hotels, which have been, which have mainly been looked at as, as the sort of, I guess, sectors that will fare worst from the crisis, short term in any event? I mean, uh, in, in China, we saw after uh, softening of the measurements, a kind of rebound effect in retail, but nevertheless, uh, consumer confidence even there is um, um, not good. Um, so I think the uh, negative impacts on consumer demand due to uncertainty will will last for a long time, which of course will have negative impacts on retail, but at the moment, due to some softening, uh, I mean that um, there will be some rebound effects as well. So, uh, but we have again have to wait how long will be the measurements and how dramatic they will be. And um, for the hotel sector, it's um, still even more unsecure. Uh, I mean, Spain has recently announced that they can imagine that tourism start earliest till end of the year. Um, so we have to, to wait what will be the case in Germany. But uh, I think there I see personally still the, the largest risk that this uh, uh, part of uh, the economy in terms of big congresses and so on will be uh, will come to normality at, at the end of all business sectors. So I think there they will be facing for the longest time the toughest uh, challenges. Apologies if we haven't managed to answer everything. Um, I'll, I'll try to pick pick up a number of the other questions are really around um, where do we see the opportunities? Um, so do we do we think that um, 
that investors will begin to reallocate capital to what they perceive to be more successful or, or better positioned assets, more resilient assets classes, such as logistics, I guess. Um, and, and also which strategies um, are most likely to be successful in, in this environment. I mean, interesting to note, you know, the, the Blackstone rays um, for opportunistic. Um, so just as a, just as a, a kind of final question to everybody, um, I, I suppose, what, what do you see as the, as, as the most resilient or better positioned assets in terms of the crisis? Um, and are there specific strategies um, that you think will, uh, will actually help investors particularly come through the, come through the crisis? Um, in a sense, in uh, you know, and and be as resilient as they can to it. Um, maybe let's let's start with you, uh, Reiner. Just just in just in terms of um, strategies, classes that that you think will uh, will I suppose be more successful in this environment. Well, I think I've, I feel quite comfortable with with what we currently do, and uh, I'm I'm pretty sure that residential investments. And especially those who have, let's say, a, uh, a clear purpose in its strategy, like student housing, like micro living on the longer end of the rental spectrum, will definitely be a uh, fantastic addition to any investor's uh, portfolio. And uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, yeah, we don't have a liquidity uh, a crisis here. So there is a lot of liquidity in the market, which is looking for investment targets. And uh, amongst those where you can raise question marks to a lot of these, especially on, on the residential products, there is uh, a clear way forward which uh, implies a very limited uh, risk exposure for an investor. And I think this will lead in the next, next months or on a, on a horizon of 12 to 24 months to strong inflows into this sector. Okay, good. Christiana? I can only emphasize again what I... What I, what I said before, so I think even now it's even more key to um, yeah, to focus on an ESG strategy and an ESG standards to be not only get out of this crisis with as little damage as, as possible, but also to be well positioned once this crisis is over. And that's what we also see in the market, of course, um, there's just we see several capacity issues when it comes, particularly in the retail sector, when it comes to dealing with 600, 400 shops and all the tenant um, negotiations at the same time. So it's kind of a tough job for, for asset managers right now. Um, but once there's it's, it's a bit more quiet there, so what we see there that is more and more investors are currently looking at these ESG topics to, to yeah, develop their own uh, res resilient and um, adequate strategy and yeah, start implementing it right now. Okay, great. Um, and, and Holger, um, just from you, and it, it may also be useful, I suppose, just from a tick box point of view, in terms of what you are willing to lend on, because that may also give an indication of, of what those views are in terms of the, the more resilient markets. I believe the short term implications which we are currently seeing are going to be managed by the sponsors and by the landlord. Um, deferral of rents, um, maybe also an exchange of uh, removing break options or something like that. Um, there will be always a way to communicate and to cooperate. The long term implications that is then probably back to fundamentals and uh, will very much depend on how the economy recovers, how quick the economy recovers and uh, to which extent. So the outlook, my point of view, depends very much on the question how long the current lockdown is going to last because as long as it lasts, uh, the more difficult it will be to come back to what we can have as a normal level. Lending will be and will continue to be on a cautious level. Our underwriting as such has not necessarily changed, but um, there's certainly no room for any experiments or any, anything which is um, at higher risk. 
And um, whether that comes back to an environment where we get slightly more entrepreneurial um, depends very much on the economy as such. So no, no forecast on that point. Okay, great. Thanks very much. Um, Tobias. I can only agree with what um, Rainer said that, that resi is, um, well, or any kind of um, residential use will, will be, um, or is, is the, the most resilient um, asset class. Um, I see what, what, what Holger said regarding lending is more cautious. There's no space for, for, for risky um, properties right now. And that's also so what, what we experience in, in our conversations with investors. They, some of them want to, um, or they, they have the, the wish that they can buy, um, that they will have fire sales. Um, but we didn't see this 10 years ago. Um, I don't expect too many fire sales uh, in, in these days. Um, yeah. In terms of uh, where I see a, um, a strategy where one can uh, buy, I would, as I always said, um, it, because usually you at, at this point of, of the um, uh, of the meeting you ask a question where would you invest in and um i i would as i always say I, I would go to small cities in germany where you have um the the backbone of the german economy even though they are suffering these days as well they are still um very stable tenants um and in our portfolio we don't have any rent deferment we don't have um tenants asking for uh decreasing um the rents so this this would be my um, yeah my proposal to go away from from A and B cities, uh, but also have a look at office properties and and warehouse properties in um, in smaller cities up to fifty thousand um, people. Okay, good. And, uh, and and Marcus, what's your sense? I mean, interesting as well for, for, from what Tobias was saying um, that probably uh, the German food sector um appears to be doing re relatively well at the moment yeah no no for sure on, on in terms of retail it's it's not all retail and there's still strong in, in investor interest for um uh, retail uh, that is is food anchored of, of course but uh, i think in 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 terms of uh, opportunity uh, re resilience and opportunities it's a question of of sectors and types of uh, of, of properties and and i think we went through that uh, with opportunities on, on, on food retailing, of course, on, uh, on residential, on logistics, but also on offices that offer uh, that um, long-term income security, not only by contracts, but also by uh, types of buildings um, that can offer flexible space, that can adapt to this uh, new way. Um, we will probably be living this uh, world with more flexibility, with more um uh, uh, with the, with a stronger mix between being present in the office in order to communicate but also combining this with more um uh, home office and a, a smart smart working um atmosphere so travel uh, flexibility of the accommod um, accommodation flexibility of the location and um, it meet, needs to make sense for somebody to go into the office in, in the future just to go into the office for the routine uh, will not be uh, sufficient. So the office needs to offer something, the location needs to offer something special for, to, for employees to make it worth their while to go. So it's a question of, of, of sectors um, and uh, opportunities, of course, uh, will arise as, as well. Um, on the one hand, I think a stability in income, as, as mentioned, will be more valuable than ever. So um, uh, a world with a zero interest rate uh, real estate as an asset class offering income will be um, more valuable. So um, I think in these sectors and uh, in, in these specific properties, uh, yields could even decrease um, uh, further. And of course, we'll see opportunities where uh, in all these areas which we've seen critical um, uh, around hotels, around uh, retail, uh, around debt, so everywhere where there's a need for recapitalization, I think um, this will offer an opportunity for um, new ways, new investors, uh, new capital to uh, to move in. So recapitalizing these sectors and existing deals will certainly be an um, opportunity across the board. 
Okay, that's great. Um, thanks very much for, for sharing all of your views. Um, I'm just putting this screen up, uh, A, to say thank you to everybody for joining us from kind of 25 different countries, um, 300 registrations, um, which was great. Thank you for that. Uh, the slides from both Matty and uh, Christiana are both available on the website at the moment. So if you go to investmentbriefings.com, um, you'll find it there. Um, you'll also find our upcoming events and we've got uh, we've got sessions which are on student housing and micro living and co-living uh, next week on April the 28th um, on the 29th we're looking at uh, uh, innovation districts and winning cities um, I think very interesting topic there in terms of innovation uh, particularly um, in terms of some of those are, are also biotech health areas um, and just how that, that part of the industry um, is going to be changed by the current crisis um, and then the following week we'll be looking at ESG resilience and those strategies um, so do check those out and register for those if those are of interest for you um, thanks very much to uh, all of the panel um, for sharing your insights today and thank you also uh, to all of the attendees for the for the question and answers I hope we managed to, to answer the majority of them um, thanks very much for joining us um, stay safe stay well stay connected um, and look forward to uh, to seeing everybody at the next event thank you Thank you.